leaving us very soon. Ashton to my right. And what day is your last day? July 22nd. July 22nd. So um, uh, I don't like that, but I do <laughs> congratulate you, though. That's good. We appreciate everything that you've been doing for Thank us, you. and, and you've been a good, good help and good to work with. I appreciate you Thank being you to my right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then I think either communications or law school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bless your heart. All right. Um, approval of minutes. We have the minutes in the packet. Entertain a motion for approval. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Minutes are approved. We have. Oh, do we need a roll on that? Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Call the roll, please. Senator Carroll. Senator Castlin. Senator Douglas. Here. Senator Givens. Senator Kerr. Senator McGarvey. Here. Senator Meredith. Here. Senator Nemes. Senator Webb. Senator West. Here. Representative Beckler. Here. Representative Bentley. Here. Representative Blanton. Representative Bridges. Representative Dossett. Representative Fisher. Here. Representative Fleming. <coughs> Representative Flood. Representative Fugit. Here. Representative Gentry. Here. Representative Hale. Here. Representative Hart. Here. Representative Hatton. Representative McCool. Here. Representative Nemes. Representative Palumbo. Here. Representative Prunty. Representative Raymond. Here. Representative Reed. Here. Representative Riley. Here. Representative Santoro. Representative Tipton. Here. Representative Wilner. Here. Co Chair McDaniel. Co Chair Petrie. Here. Now. <laughs> Now we'll entertain a motion on the minutes. And I have a second. All in favor? Ah, all opposed. Minutes are approved. Thank y'all very much. First up, we have on the agenda items, uh, motor fuels, average wholesale price. And I'm going to ask if Perry Nutt, staff economist, legislative Economic Analysis, LRC, and John Rocker, Chief Economist, LR, Legislative Economic Analysis, LRC, come to the table. If you will introduce yourselves for the record, please. John Runker, LRC, Chief Economist. Perry Knight, LRC, Staff Economist. Each of you raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And um, what we're going to do is this. Uh, there's been recent administrative um, action to prevent the implementation of a two cent increase in the motor fuels tax. Uh, I'm not making a statement as to the soundness of the policy decision or not, or the legality or the constitutionality of it, but I think it'd be best if we understood motor fuels tax a little bit and try to understand what the implication and effects are. Uh, of that action. And to that end, Mr. Nutt, Mr. Ronker have agreed to come in and give us a brief overview of the motor fuels tax in Kentucky and broadly how that two cents plays into our estimates as well as the impacts of it. The two of you will proceed, please. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Petrie, Co Chair McDaniel, and members of the committee. As we said before, my name is Perry Nutt. I'm an economist with the LRC here. Um, today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of Kentucky Motors fuel stacks. Um, first, I'll talk about the three components of the motor fuel stacks. Also discuss the legislative changes that took place in 2015. Uh, we'll review how the motor fuels tax rate and the number of gallons subject to the tax have changed over time. We'll also quickly look at the importance of the motor fuels tax to the road fund. Also provide an overview of how the motor fuels tax receipts are shared with local government entities. And then I'll finish with a review of the statutory conditions relating to the motor fuels tax rate for fiscal year 23. So let's start with a brief look at the, at the motor fuels tax. 
The motor fuels tax, Kentucky's motor fuels tax has three parts. The excise tax, the supplemental tax, and the P staff or the petroleum storage tank environmental assurance fee, which is 1.4 cents per gallon. Now the excise tax is 9% multiplied by the average wholesale price of gasoline. And these receipts from this particular part of the tax goes to the road fund. The average wholesale price is determined quarterly through a survey of fuel dealers and the survey is conducted in the first month of each quarter. So the AWP survey months are July, October, January, and April. The average wholesale price used to set the excise tax rate is the average of the four quarterly survey values from the previous fiscal year. By statute, the annual change in the average wholesale price is limited to plus or minus 10%. But in no case can the average wholesale price that is used to set the excise tax be below the statutory minimum, which currently is $2.17.7 per gallon. Now the supplemental tax, the second part of the motor fuels tax, it is a fixed rate. It does not vary, unlike the excise tax. It is fixed at $0.05 cents per gallon for gasoline and $0.02 cents per gallon for diesel fuel, which is sometimes referred to as special fuels within the statute. These receipts are also deposited into the road fund. And of course, the final, the final part of the motor fuel stacks is a 1.4 cent fee for the Petroleum Source Tank Environmental Assurance Fund, uh, and those go to that particular fund. <clears throat> now, Kentucky's la the last change to the motor fuel stacks occurred with the passage of House Bill 299 which was during the 2015 regular session. Uh, during, this, during this time, the average wholesale price of gasoline was declining very rapidly. And since at that time, the statutes allowed the motor fuel tax to adjust on a quarterly basis, the motor fuel tax was going to decline by 10 cents per gallon during fiscal year 2015. House Bill 299 froze the AWP at $2.17.7 per gallon in the fourth quarter of 2015 and for each quarter in fiscal year 2016. So House Bill 299 increased the, max, the minimum AWP used to calculate the excise tax rate from $1.78.6 per gallon to, as I said before, $2.17.7 per gallon. In other words, the minimum excise tax rate was increased from 16.1 cents per gallon to 19.6 cents per gallon. Uh, overall, this action by the General Assembly allowed the motor fuels tax to decline in fiscal year 2015, but not as much as it would have under the prevailing statutes at that time. Under the provisions of House Bill 299, after fiscal year 2016, the motor fuels excise tax rate of course, it's been tied to the annual average wholesale price. In other words, prior to 2015, or 2015, prior to the fourth quarter of 2015, you had a quarterly adjustment in the excise tax rate. After that time, you had an annual adjustment, which began in 2017. Since uh, 2017, or from 2016, I'm sorry, through fiscal year 2021, the average wholesale price from the annual survey has been below the minimum AWP. So as a result, the motor fuels excise tax has remained at 19.6 per gallon, and the total motor fuels tax has been held constant at 26 cents per gallon. Just for a moment, that 26 cents per gallon, um, if I'm recalling correctly, we are on the low end of the gas tax or motor fuels tax in Kentucky relative to all adjoining states with the exception to maybe Tennessee, which we probably tie or come close to? Uh, Tennessee currently, as of July 1, is at 27.4 cents per gallon. Um, the only state around us that is below us is Missouri, and they're at 22.4 cents per gallon. Okay, everyone else is higher. Everybody else is higher, and, most the, and the primary reason that they are higher is that uh, four of those states, Illinois, Indiana, Virginia, and West Virginia, all apply a wholesale sales tax to motor fuels sales, whereas we do not. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. All right. This next slide just shows the motor fuels tax rate since 2004. 
Um, prior to 2004, the reason I didn't go back any further is that prior to 2004, there was no change in the motor fuels tax rate because the average wholesale price was below the statutory minimum at that time, which was a dollar and eleven cents per gallon. Uh, after 2004, the average wholesale price and the motor fuels tax increased by approximately 10 percent annually, or a little more than a penny uh, per gallon per year. You'll see that the motor fuel tax peaked in the first quarter of 2015 at 32 and a half cents per gallon, but fell quickly during the fiscal year, as I said before, as the average wholesale price declined. Uh, in the first, for example, in the first quarter of fiscal year 2015, the average wholesale price, as measured by the survey, was three dollars and 14 cents per gallon, and by the fourth quarter, it had fallen to a dollar 44 cents per gallon. The 2015 General Assembly took action, as I said before, House Bill 299 froze AWP at $2.17.7 per gallon, and of course set the rate at 26, the total motor fuel tax rate at 26 cents per gallon. So in other words, there's two factors, I think, that provided an incentive to change the motor fuel tax statutes in 2015. First, if the General Assembly had not acted, the motor fuel tax rate would have fallen by 10 cents per gallon which on an annualized basis is $300 million. That would have been a very large hit to the road fund. Also, without General Assembly action, since at that time the AWP minimum was $1.78.6 per gallon, and AWP increases were limited to 10% on a year-over-year -year basis, it, if the rate had fallen to 22 and a half cents under the current statute in 2015, it would have taken five years to recover, to get back to the 32 and a half cents. So I think those are the two primary reasons why changes were made during that time. So next slide, let's think about motor fuels tax receipts for a minute. Um, motor fuel tax receipts are, of course, determined or a function of the motor fuels tax rate and the taxable gallons, or the gallons that are subject to the tax. Uh, the main point I want you to take away from this slide is that taxable gallons are relatively stable. They don't vary much with changes in the price of fuel. You'll see that taxable gallons on average in Kentucky are about 3.1 billion. Um, approximately 70% of that is gasoline sales. 30% of that is diesel sales, so 2.1 billion gallons of gasoline are subject to the tax. About a billion gallons of diesel fuel are subject to the tax. Um, since we sell or we have taxable gallons of, of 3.16 billion gallons a year, a penny of the tax generally yields, on average, $31.6 million. Uh, the thing to remember also, I think, here is that with little variability, and taxable gallons sold each year, and with a constant motor fuels tax rate, uh, there's been modest growth in the motor fuels tax receipts since 2016. Next slide. <clears throat> I'll go through this slide quickly. I just wanted to simply show the total road fund revenue since 1996, along with the two most important components of the road fund. That's the motor fuels tax and the motor vehicle usage tax. You'll see that the growth in the road fund is largely dependent on these two taxes. As the average wholesale price of gasoline increased from 1996 to 2014, motor fuel excise tax increased along with road fund receipts. However, during the recession years of 2009 and 2010, you'll see that the road fund declined slightly then, and that's because Kentucky motor vehicle sales fell sharply, and that's what contributed to that two-year decline in the road fund during that time. Uh, in 2015, in the fourth quarter, as I said before, the General Assembly froze the motor fuels tax rate at 26 cents, and the rate has not changed since that time. So with a constant rate, motor fuels tax rate, limited variation in taxable gallons, motor fuels tax collections, as you can see since 2016, been relatively stable, and they average about $756 million per year over the last five years, and the previous high was $886 million in 2014. You'll note the most recent uptick in road fund receipts in fiscal year 21, they actually reached a record of $1.642 billion. That was largely tied to strong growth in the motor vehicle usage tax. Uh, the receipts for the motor vehicle usage tax in fiscal year 21 were $621 million, 
and that was a, about 20% more than the previous record receipts for that particular tax category, which was $514 million in 2019. On, on current numbers, uh, closing out June the 30th, your best estimate, will we meet, fall short of, or exceed the expected revenues to the, to the uh, road fund? Based on 11 months of collections and um, what, we're, what we are currently seeing, I expect us to be very close on the room, very, very close. Thank you. <clears throat> I think this slide um, just basically provides an overview of how motor fuel tax receipts are allocated. In other words, how they are re revenue shared with local government entities. If you start with the current 20 cent, 26 cents per gallon tax rate, uh, there are certain statutory off the top adjustments prior to revenue sharing. Uh, the first adjustment, of course, is a 1.4 cents per gallon that goes to the PSTAF fund. Then by statute, there's 2.1 cents per gallon that's taken off the top. In other words, it's not revenue shared and it remains in the road fund. After these two deductions, the remaining motor fund tax receipts are revenue shared and 51.8% of those receipts stay in the road fund and 48.2% of those receipts are revenue shared as reflected in the pie chart here. Now, finally, um, let's do a quick review of what happened to the average wholesale price of gasoline in fiscal year 22. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to review what happened to the average wholesale price of gasoline fiscal year 22. Okay. Uh, remember the fiscal year 22 annual average wholesale price determines the motor fuels tax rate in fiscal year 23. Okay, just to Excuse clarify, me. anybody that's looking at packets, some of us will have packets that refer to fiscal year 2021. They're oh, probably sorry. printed in blue. The ones in black appear to be 2022. Two. So that's yeah, the I'm description sorry. we made. Yeah, there was, there was a correction that was made. So uh, remember, because the rate in a particular year is determined based on the AWP from the previous year, we're thinking about 23. We want to look at the AWP from fiscal year 22. Okay, so it should be, as it is on the slide, fiscal year 2022. So remember that the fiscal year 22 annual AWT, AWP determines the motor fuels tax rate in 23 unless it exceeds the maximum AWP that's in statute. So if you look at the four surveys that were taken during those survey months in fiscal year 22, the average is $2.51 per gallon. But the AWP maximum is two dollars and 39 and a half cents per gallon so the maximum awp by statute would be used to determine the excise tax rate in fiscal year 23. so the total motor fuels tax rate in fiscal 23 according to statute would be 21.6 cents per gallon for the excise tax five cents per gallon for the supplemental tax 1.4 cents per gallon for the p staff fee that would be 28 cents per gallon, which is two cents per gallon higher than or compared to fiscal year 22. However, as the chairman noted early in this meeting, the emergency regulation, which was filed on June 2nd, will keep the motor fuels tax rate at its current level of 26 cents per gallon. So to kind of review what's the value of that two cents per gallon, when we said every penny is $31.6 million, on an annualized basis, so two pennies would be about 63.2 million on an annualized basis. Uh, the estimated road fund loss for half a year would be $16.4 million, and the estimated revenue sharing loss or the amount uh, not going to local government entities for half a year would be about $15.2 million. In terms of savings to consumers, you're thinking about both commercial and non-commercial purchases of fuels. Consumers obviously will not have to pay the additional two cents, but they will pay the same rate as they are currently paying now. Uh, finally, we were also asked to look at what the elimination of the two cent increase means to commercial purchases of fuels. Uh, that's kind of a hard number to get to. We have limited data in which to answer or to address this issue. Um, our best estimate right now is that approximately 750 million gallons of diesel fuel is for commercial purposes. 
to our best rough cut estimate is that savings to commercial purchasers would be about seven and a half million dollars for half of a fiscal year. Um, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my comments today. If there's any questions, we'll try and answer. Thank you. One, one real quick, I just want to make sure <clears throat> I may have missed it. Um, we budget to estimates. Uh, and so we've budgeted for road plan uh, right. to estimates. Um, the increase was a portion or all of that included in the estimate that we budgeted to um, so that when it's removed, we're a little over budget. Yeah. How uh, much and if so? You're, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, it's from a budget perspective, it's a little different. It's kind of a nuance. Uh, remember, the uh, uh, general fund and road fund estimates are determined by the uh, consensus forecasting group, which may be modified by actions of the General Assembly. Uh, as part of the, um, uh, the consensus forecasting group determinations last December, they incorporated an increase in the motor fuels tax in fiscal 23 of 1.6 cents per gallon. So they didn't quite get to the two cents per gallon, but they did incorporate a 1.6 cents per gallon, and that's what you budgeted to. All right. Okay. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. Uh, first of all, appreciate that explanation. Thank you. Uh, back in fiscal year 2021, I'm looking at uh, road fund motor fuels and motor vehicle usage tax receipts. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows, and, and you talked about this briefly, about the motor vehicle usage tax being way up in fiscal year 2021. Yes. Um, which has generated a, a high receipt year for us. Do you have any idea how much of that was, or if any, a higher sales volume, or was it just uh, more vehicle value increases? We don't have data for that currently. We've looked at that in the past. Um, um, my, my inclination, and this is just my, my speculation, is that it's a combination of both, but probably mostly because sales of vehicles increased fairly slowly. And I think in fiscal year 21, it was probably more due or more attributable to an increase in the value of cars so rather than the number of cars so. Okay. I I appreciate it, that. We'll, I know that we'll, was like the we'll COVID be, year, and I didn't yeah, we'll, know how much. We'll be of happy. The, we'll be happy to try and get that information. For okay, you. It, it's yeah. not a big yeah, deal. I'm that's, just that's curious for moving can. forward what we're kind of okay. looking at. There. Yeah, we'll Thanks. be glad to get that for you, Representative okay. Gentry. Very good. I see no other questions or anybody seeking recognition. We'll move on to the next. Oh, uh, Representative Bentley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. How do you define commercial fuels? In in this particular case, that that was kind of hard to do. And uh, what we tried to look at with this particular case was, and remind me, John, because we used national data. We didn't have Kentucky data, which we're trying to acquire. But the national data came from the Energy Information Administration. And that was for Class 3 trucks and above. And Class 3 trucks would be 14,000 gross vehicle weight rating and above. Um, so think about box vans up to dual axle, the 26,000 pound trucks are basically tandem dual axle dump trucks all the way up to the class seven, class eight trucks, which would be semi-tractor trailers. So that's what we were trying to modify. It, it's a really rough estimate, understand that, but that's what we were trying to get at. Mr. Chairman, may I? Please. Sure. So you're considering only diesel there, probably? Yes, yes, because most of those trucks are diesel. Okay, how is jet fuel taxed? Uh, jet fuel is not considered a special fuel, and it's not taxed under the motor fuel tax statute. Uh, jet fuel is subject to the sales tax, unlike gasoline and diesel fuel. Uh, now, there is a jet fuels sales tax credit as well for certain large certificated uh, carriers within the state. Well, I'm, I'm from... Uh an area that has marathon refinery in it. Mm -hmm. And I know how many millions of gallons of jet fuel we produce each week just for UPS. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any value on that or that tax? We have, we, have, we have value on that. It's through a separate taxing structure not related to this. Mm -hmm. It's a different category under sales with a cap on how much is paid yeah. uh, that anyone could reach. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. 
the, the, the cap on that is $1 million a year per certificated carrier. Okay. So no other person seeking recognition for a question or comment. We'll move on to Secretary Gray next, if he's willing. If you'll make sure the green light is on, the yes, microphone is sufficiently close. Can if you hear introduce me? introduce yourself for the record. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jim Gray, and I am Transportation Secretary. If you'll raise your right hand. Yes, sir. You swear or affirm to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed. You know what the topic is, and, and yes, you have as much or more information than anybody else on this topic. Please proceed. Well, all right, sir. Well, I'll do my best. I have subject matter experts who can help me whom, if I don't, so they're right here with us today as well. I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to join you today, and <clears throat> I look forward to talking about, in general, the price of motor fuels and the road fund, and in particular, how the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet is dealing with it. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about the two cent, the, uh, the suspension of the two cents and its effect. And I'd also like to talk about where we are in the cabinet as it relates to dealing with and addressing efficiently and responsibly the inflation, the inflationary pressures that we're dealing with. Just like in the private sector, we're adjusting and we're adapting. I think we can all agree that these are unusual and extraordinary times. I can say I, I lived through 1981 and 1982 and 1983 and I remember paying 22% interest on a working capital loan. And I remember 13% inflation. So that's what I meant when I said that we've all learned to adjust and adapt. And I'll say about why we're doing it, especially in the cabinet today. Now, <clears throat> as everyone knows, and a part of the reason that we're here today is that Governor Bashir has taken a number of steps to help Kentuckians, in his view, who are struggling in this volatile economy, including activating price gouging laws, trying to prevent a spike in tolls on the bridges in Louisville, which I have vigorously helped him with as well, and suspending an increase in motor vehicle property taxes, and of particular interest here today, suspending or freezing a scheduled two cents per gallon increase in the state motor fuels tax. Now, as you heard Ron just describe, the motor fuels tax has not increased in more than seven years. It has been 24.6 cents per gallon of gasoline since April the 1st, 2015. And the governor's suspension would continue, will continue, for the next six or seven months, which represents the same as it has been for the past seven years. The governor consulted our cabinet prior to issuing his emergency regulation. And we assured him, and I stated at the time, that suspending the two cent increase would have no material impact on the transportation cabinet's budget, nor would it compromise the work that we have planned or that we have in progress, some 1,500 projects across the state and a $1.7 billion road plan. The estimated impact to the road fund, my numbers may be a bit different than Ron's, but we're close. My, the estimated impact to the road fund is $28.2 million through mid-January, according to the state budget director's office. That equates, that equals about 1.6% of the enacted road fund revenue estimate for fiscal 2023. Now, to get through this suspension period, the Transportation Cabinet will do what Kentucky families and what all of you all are doing in your businesses where you are. We'll do what Kentucky families are doing all over the Commonwealth. We will adjust and adapt. Now, I know there's a school of thought that a savings of two cents per gallon for consumers isn't worth the funds or the dollars that could be flowing into the road fund. And to that, I'll just say what the governor has said. A little bit of help is better than no help at all. 
Now, I was here advocating for an increase in motor fuels fee, the gasoline tax, myself, in 2021. 2021, 2021, in economic terms today, was ages ago. And in my view, those families struggling need all the real and, yes, even the symbolic help that we can provide. And I said I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of inflation. I also want to talk about the impact of revenue sharing. Now, and I know that colleagues are here from, uh, from other agencies as well, KBT, CACO, and I appreciate their points of view. Let me talk a little bit about where we are. And Bobby Joe Lewis, our Commissioner of Rural and Municipal Aid, is here with me today as well. Even with the suspension of the two cent increase, local governments will receive more in absolute dollars in revenue this year, the coming year, or the year that we're in today, about $17 million more by budget estimates. And that represents an $8 million increase for the Rural Secondary Road Program, $6.7 million increase for county road aid, and $2.8 million increase for municipal road aid. And counties, will, local governments will also receive their revenue sharing funds on schedule with the first payment at the beginning of August. Now, I ask you to recall, too, that Governor Bashir has committed that he will propose to the next General Assembly, to you all, to use funds from the general fund surplus to restore revenue sharing to the level included in the budget for fiscal year 2023. In other words, that 28.5 million. I asked earlier, I said I'd like to talk for a minute about, or a few minutes about inflation, the uh, status of our bid lettings for our projects, and the efficiency of our operations today. Yes, inflation is affecting the Cabinet's operations, and especially the Department of Highways, as it is everything else. Inflation makes it hard to plan and occasionally hard to budget, or harder to budget even. <clears throat> we recently hosted the Cabinet and Ohio's Department of Transportation recently hosted an industry forum in Covington for bidders who are interested in the Brent Spence Bridge project. We had contractors from around the country. Many of them were concerned that suppliers would not guarantee prices for more than 30 days. Now, at the Cabinet, the Division of Construction Procurement Purchasing sets the official engineer's estimate for individual projects in Kentucky. And I want to share with you just some examples of some of those projects that we're addressing today. What the procurement department does is it tries to estimate, it works to estimate a fair and reasonable price for the projects by work items that are required for a given project. Overall project costs have been on the rise, so it's been a moving target. The oil price, oil price information service says a gallon of diesel has nearly doubled from $2.50 a gallon in January to $4.87 today. So not surprisingly, contractors factor those increases into their bids and costs can change rapidly. Now, for example, on March the 24th, and this is a project many of you all know about, we led a major project on US 127, part of which will take the highway, that highway, off the Wolf Creek Dam. It's been in plans for some time. The cabinet received at that time just a single bid. Our awards committee declined that project because it was 17% over the engineer's estimate. We rebid the project again in June. It was still over the engineer's estimate, but the engineer's estimate had been adjusted based on the inflationary pressures that we're experiencing today. And we got two bids. The low bid was still right at the 105 million mark. The second bid was over 120 million. 
When I talked about efficiency, I was talking about that we are working to ensure that we get more than a single bid. On many of our asphalt surfacing and pavement rehabilitation projects, the awards committee has seen bids go up, not down, when the project is relet. Re Another example, a rehab project in Christian County was let on April the 28th. In that case, there was one bid only. It was 17% above the engineer's estimate. Ordinarily, that bid might have been rejected and relet. But remember that we are also dealing with the dynamic and the with the dynamic of meeting public safety and the condition of the pavement was in such bad repair that we, the judgment was to proceed with that project and to accept the bid and to award the project. I want to talk a minute about something that, um, that Senator McDaniel knows a lot about, and that is shortage of supplies. Uh, Two things here. The cabinet has temporarily modified paint specifications to allow the use of a broader spectrum of colors because of the shortage of paint, a slightly different shade of yellow than we'd normally require. This is just examples of how we're adjusting and, and adapting. And as I said, or as I said, as Chairman McDaniel knows, there's also a shortage of cement and extended lead times for valves and some electrical, comp electrical components all have contributed to some project delays. I will say, however, that com the, the civil industry compared to, compared to the buildings industry is experiencing less severe inflationary pressures, not as severe inflationary pressures as the building industry. And perhaps part of that is because there are so many more materials in vertical construction projects, in buildings projects. So we have not seen, or I'm not, <clears throat> we are not as aware of those projects having the equivalent price pressure. That is all to say that we're doing our best to manage these projects efficiently and the full process of letting contracts, estimating, estimating and letting pro projects within the context of the circumstances that we're dealing with today. So let me wrap up by saying that um, I'm proud that the cabinet topped $1 billion in lettings in calendar year 2021. Uh, this year through May, lettings are at $572 million, and that's putting us on a path to lettings of a billion or perhaps even more for calendar 2022. We're already halfway there. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take any questions that um, that I can handle. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Gray. Yes, sir. Representative McCool. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. <coughs> Secretary, just, uh, just so I understand completely uh, and clarify a previous statement, that all budgeted road fund funding projects that have been will be implemented within the road uh, fund this year. Yes, sir. Anything that's in the uh, budget this year will be implemented yes, as, sir. as currently scheduled. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. There may be some adjustments in now well, I don't want to I don't want to condition that. I'm just saying that you know that we know that projects sometimes have phases to them that uh, maybe an engineering phase may take a little bit longer than the original schedule. And so the letting calendar may change a bit, but there is no plan to adjust anything today. Would, would we be notified if there is any changes? Oh, we can do that, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Saying no one else, I've got, a, I've got just a general question. <clears throat> sorry, oh, Representative Namus, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanna say up front that, Secretary, I think you should be the model of how to run an, uh, a cabinet for any Republican or Democratic administration, I think the way you get back with people, the way you're honest, the way you answer questions, I want to commend you for that on the record. Um, I do want to make sure I, I'm, I'm clear on one thing, and I very much appreciate you saying that it's important even for the symbolic uh, help for Kentuckians, but I want to make sure I get these numbers. 
uh, because I understand politics and I understand symbolism just like anybody else. Yeah. Here's what I understand. Um, the road fund, because of the, the freeze, is expected to lose $35 million by January. And if we allow it to go through the, through the whole year, it's $60 million. But here's what I want your confirmation on. According to the Federal Highway Administration, the average Kentuckian drives 14,263 miles per year. Divide that by 12, the average Kentuckian drives 1,188 miles per month. If they're saving two cents per gallon, and according to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, uh, they say that the average car in 2022 goes 25.7 miles per gallon. Round that down to make it 25 miles per gallon. What we've just, well, if you do that per month, the average Kentucky driver saves 94 cents per month. So my question to you is, is losing the money to the gas fund really worth 94 cents per month to Kentuckian? Or are we doing, in fact, just something that's symbolic and political, but not meaningful to the wallet of the Kentucky taxpayer? Well, as I said, Mr. Representative, that I was in 2021, I was an advocate for increasing the, uh, and so was the governor, for increasing the motor fuels fees. And I said that earlier that these times are extraordinary, that 2021 was almost ages ago in terms of economic terms and economic context. And so I think I also said what I will just reemphasize that a little help is better than no help at all. And that if we can adjust and adapt and not compromise our road plan, make adjustments and adaptions, then if it's helping the public even a little bit and helping that woman like I know who works for the transportation cabinet making $31,000 a year, I got two kids trying to play baseball, travel with them, single mother, if it's helping her just a little bit, even, even her attitude about it, yeah. then I would say that it, it sure might be worth it. Now, I know there's another school of thought. I understand. Mr. Chairman, if I might real quickly, just very quickly. Uh, I appreciate that. But when we go around the state talking about our gas tax freeze, I want to make sure everybody knows it's 94 cents per month. Uh, I would also note that we have, and we've heard a lot of, in this committee and the Transportation Committee about the dilapidated state in which we find our, our bridges, very dangerous areas, um, and, and we find our roads. I would think that, that look, I've got my boys in, in swimming and in, uh, in baseball also, and I know the, the value of a dollar, and I want to thank you for asking the EPA to get rid of RFG. That's long. It needs to, needs to go away. I wish they hadn't said no. But, but that mother that you're talking about needs to understand, and we need to educate more, that her bridges that she pays for are in a dangerous state, yet we're giving Kentucky taxpayers a 94 cent break, acting like we're doing something meaningful while taking tens of millions of dollars out of the road fund, out of our county roads and state roads. And I think that's quite dangerous. So that's, that's the other side of the, of the coin I see. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's, let, if I may say, let, let's remember too, that we, are, we will be receiving all together from the IIJA, the bipartisan infrastructure law, we will be receiving altogether for bridges and highways $210 million a year more for the next five years, which represents about 30 percent more. And that, that funding itself can be properly, uh, properly dedicated to just the projects that, that you're describing. Thank you. I want to pick up on it just for a second. I remember a BR sub that we had last interim when we were real clear about having about $750 million in the hole on maintenance alone, no new projects. And I know that today we've talked about road plan, but maintenance is a different, um, a different animal, a different category. Um, inflation costs going up extraordinarily. Maintenance $750 million in the hole an actual savings to a Kentuckian of maybe a dollar a month, which is much less than what it would take to repair a vehicle after hitting a bad pothole or a bad bridge or something else. There are two schools of thought about how to approach that. It's a head scratcher at times. Right. Uh, there may be other avenues to pursue to actually give, but it just doesn't make a great lot of sense with inflation at 17% over on bids uh, plus. 
uh, and continuing to climb. And then the other thing is that of that 30 something million dollar hit or 60 million over a year, a third of that is probably going to commercial trucking, that two cent non-increase. That's not a Kentuckian necessarily. It also covers anybody traveling from any other state through Kentucky that purchases gas here. So when you look at the actual impact of the move, the actual limited impact to a particular Kentuckian or family or set of Kentuckians, seems relatively minuscule in comparison to uh, the price tag associated with it, which everyone uses and travels on that common asset called our asphalt roads. Yes. Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Representative Nemus, I drive a truck which doesn't get as good a gas mileage. So I calculated my own figure at $1.47 per month. So I, I get, get a little more than the dollar per month. Uh, Secretary Gray, uh, thank you for being here. And, and I, as I understand your comments, the governor's recommendation would be that uh, we supplement this shortcoming for general fund appropriations. And I'll just remind everyone that in this last budget, the General Assembly took unprecedented measures to put general fund dollars already into the road fund so there would be money there to do a match for these federal dollars coming in. I believe that was a tune of around $250 million. Uh, we also uh, changed policy uh, on where the state police is funded. So we've put a lot of extra general fund dollars that, uh, dollars that were a part of the road fund uh, from the general fund to help supplement the road fund. Now, we can debate back and forth what's right. the right way, but the bottom line is these are taxpayer dollars. And, and they want good roads, but they also want pay raises. We need pay raises. So every dollar we take out of general fund to go someplace else is a dollar we could be uh, uh, utilizing somewhere else. And say the bottom line is in your role, the governor's role, ours, the general assembly, we can't do much to impact gasoline prices. Uh, a lot of those are federal issues. There are issues based on international economic thing, issues going on around the world. And, and what we need to do is we need to, uh, my personal opinion is we need to challenge the Biden administration. Uh, let's open up these leases on drilling. We've got the ability to be energy independent in this country. And, and I think it's, we, we, need, we need to send the message Kentucky to, to Washington, D.C., that it's time to develop policies that have real meaningful benefits to our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tipton. Next up we have, I'm sorry, Senator Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Secretary, Hello, Mayor Senator. Gray, my forever mayor, I would say. We ran the first time That's together, right. both That's of right. our first times, I yes, think. I wanted to segue just a little from what was said earlier about uh, the $31,000 a year that the single woman, I believe you said with two children, was making. Because I had actually wanted to bring this up and that was a perfect segue for me. And I know you may not readily have this information today, but I have six months left in my term um, and I would like to know and I'm going to ask this of all the secretaries and people that are in the executive branches and other branches how many women are employed in executive well let's say 50,000 plus I mean like this $31,000 lady mm -hmm. uh, could she be raised uh, and how many women in your cabinet make, fifth, let's just say, $50,000 or more? Would you know? I don't know that number. Would Senator you Curry, get it for the absolutely. committee? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I would have a feeling that most of these cabinets are probably not represented very well, just as this committee is not. I see two. We, we came out in bright colors today, so we can be recognized. Mm -hmm. But on this committee, it's about as uneven as probably it is in many of these cabinets and uh, well i don't know why it is and a lot of people always blame it on the fact that women don't put themselves up for these positions but you know what i kind of doubt that anymore well, i kind of doubt that and i'd like to challenge yeah. you as you go forward to well i can say senator and i realize that i've worked 
for the administration and 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 for the governor. Okay, uh, I, but I appreciate the question, and I'm hoping he gets the data to you. Okay. But the topic on for today All is right. motor fuels, average wholesale yes, prices. Sir. All right. Um, and so the next up is Jim Henderson, Executive Director, CEO, of Kentucky Association of Counties. If you'll step forward to the table, and if you'll introduce yourself and anyone else that may be speaking. Sure. Thank you. I'm Jim Henderson, the Executive Director of the Kentucky Association of Counties. Kayla's probably not going to be speaking, but Kayla Carter is our policy analyst who will be helping me with the very few slides I have. Raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you, and please proceed on the topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would echo uh, Representative Nemus' comments about uh, Secretary Gray. He's uh, absolutely uh, a great Cabinet Secretary to work with, and I'm honored to follow him. Uh, thank you, Chairman Petrie, for the invitation. And uh, I was thinking about uh, Joe Friday in the Dragnet series. In what my role here today is just the facts. My, I'm here to uh, give you all information at the Chairman's request about the impacts of the uh, uh, gas tax freeze on counties. Let, let me first say um, that I fully understand um, the reality that elected officials. Uh, feel compelled at times to do something uh, to give relief to folks in what are unprecedented uh, economic times with inflation at 40-year high, energy prices being a major factor. I get it. Uh, like Secretary Gray and uh, each of you on this committee, I've been an elected official, served five terms as county judge, several county judges in the room here today. Uh, we all get the very real political pressure that comes when people are hurting. Uh, in fact, I accidentally stumbled onto a news story last night, not to share particularly with this committee, but just it's very coincidental about the, the governor's race in Georgia. Uh, I, there was a big story about the uh, uh, Stacey Abrams, who's challenging the incumbent governor, uh, Kemp, and, and making a big issue about not acting enough on the gas tax. So an incumbent Republican governor being challenged uh, by a Democrat, obviously, both making a big issue about uh, about this in the campaign so uh, I, I get it i understand that this is real my, my role here is not to be critical of any well-intentioned efforts uh, to provide relief to taxpayers but it is to urge caution and to give perspective uh, from the county view on what a reduction uh, would mean to counties i wish i'd included a few pictures i took i got these slides to the committee uh, last week but over the weekend i took a few pictures uh, back home just to send to my team to kind of show the variance in gas tax uh, or gas uh, gasoline prices. Uh, anybody have a clue what the gas uh, retail gas price is in Simpson County, my home county? No reason you would know. Uh, $3.99. I took a picture of that and sent it to my team over the weekend. And it, isn't it crazy that we're like excited that gas is now below $4 a gallon? I'm thinking about taking all my cans for my mower and other things to town to get gas because it was less than $4. Um, but you know, in my, in my home county, it was 406 at the at the the BP. It was 409 at the Minute Mart. Out at the interstate at the Pilot, it was 416. Same community, uh, all paying the same gas tax uh, amount. Uh, the, the gas tax amount on the wholesale price is the same, and it just varies. Uh, unfortunately, just 20 miles up the road in uh, Warren County, uh, from my Warren County folks here, about uh, 439 here in Frankfort. It was about 4.44. I noticed this morning, 4.39. A week ago, it was 4.59. Two, two or three weeks ago, it was 4.79. Same gas tax number in all those situations. The, the fluctuation uh, at the retail uh, price is just all over the board. Back home in my, my county, Simpson County, I'm a border county. Chairman Petrie, a neighbor uh, just a county or two over, understands this. Uh, Tennessee to my south. It doesn't matter whether gas is $2 a gallon, $4 a gallon at the map at the uh, Murphy station there at Walmart on the south side of Simpson County, on any day, half the license plates getting gas there are Tennessee license plates. They're, they're, they're buying groceries at Walmart, they're at the Lowe's, and they're getting gas. So, you know, we're, we're, we're a, a multi-state, uh, uh, our state is impacted by other states into our system so much, especially those of us on the border when it comes to the gas tax. So. But, but let's talk about the impacts of, of the gas tax on counties. I always enjoy the opportunity to make sure people understand how much of the transportation system itself is the responsibility of counties. I think people are sometimes surprised. Uh, in Kentucky, half of all the road miles in the state 
are owned and maintained by counties, by, by county governments, fiscal courts. Uh, and that's about the same nationally. I think 44% nationally uh, of, the, of the road miles are owned and maintained by counties. Um, in many rural counties, as you would not be surprised, it's actually more like two thirds of the road miles in that county are county maintained, county owned roads. My home county, we've got about 300 miles of uh, county maintained roads, about 140 of state maintained roads. And I got 14 miles of I-65 that run through uh, Simpson County. Uh, counties are also own and are responsible for maintaining a third of all the bridges in Kentucky. And again, that's pretty consistent with the national uh, average. In addition to counties, uh, our, our 40,000 uh, road miles that we own, uh, Kentucky's 400 plus cities have another 10,000 or so miles of city streets that are included in the equation. So between cities and counties, 50,000 uh, road miles are maintained by cities and counties. So that's kind of depicted there in the slide one. Slide two, gas tax distribution. That was covered well by the uh, LRC folks, a great uh, crash course in that. I, I do wanna make one clarification because this happens very often. It, it gets a little bit wonky, but, but just to be clear, so in that 58, 40, uh, 52, 48 split, a lot of times that 48 gets referred to as the, the local roads, right? But, but just to be clear, uh, for those who wouldn't necessarily know this, County Road A, the, the portion that comes directly to fiscal courts for maintaining county roads is 18.3 cents of that, okay? Uh, another 7.7 7 cents goes to the municipal road aid fund directly to cities. And then that other 22 cents that's rural secondary, those are state roads. Those are state roads. They're rural, but they're state maintained roads. So those are the responsibility of the state to maintain. Those are not in the county road aid uh, formula. Uh, again, all those are inside a county and based on formula. So unlike the other portion that could get cut up all over the state, depending on where the projects are or what have you, there is a statutory equation that makes sure every county gets a share of that in their county. But again, just to be clear, the 18.3 is the part that comes to counties. So this makes uh, the, the gas tax uh, disproportionately more important to counties than the state as a whole. Because as you saw in that earlier chart that showed the increase in the transportation budget, half of that looked to me, just quick looking at the chart, uh, in the last few years has been in the sales and usage tax. That doesn't flow to counties. Through the county, uh, for, through the formula to county road aid. So while that's good for the state overall to have the growth, just to understand the only source for county road aid is the gas tax. So again, it disproportionately is important to counties and and cities uh, relative to to that change in that. I think there should be policy discussions in the future. I welcome that opportunity. Chairman Petrie and I have had some great conversations uh, over the the last few years about tax policy in general, and, and, and you heard about these other states that have other methodologies for how they tax or, or, or uh, collect uh, fees for uh, transportation funding. How that trickles down to counties, I think would be an interesting conversation uh, in the future. Finally, uh, the third slide, this is pretty expected, I think, shows the two important trends in the last few years, just to further explain both revenue and expenses. I think most of you would expect to see that uh, chart on the right be what it is, just overall cost in construction. This is a national uh, statistic. It just, it, it is what it is. Costs are going up, right? And have been pretty steadily. You saw again from the LRC folks earlier, the gas tax revenue. Again, that that on the left is, is pretty telling, uh, specific to county road aid funding, because again, that's our only direct correlator to that. 2014 fiscal year 15, high water mark, pretty well been on the decline, began to level out and, and is uh, increasing. And so the question of how much it's not going to increase is a question of still on the increase uh, going into fiscal year uh, 23. But maybe just to make this a little more uh, applicable or, or, or I guess an example that'd be more understandable and what this really means to counties. Back in 2010, 2011, you look at those two charts, uh, 2012, just 10 years ago, uh, in our county, we were opening asphalt bids in, in the range of $50 a ton. And uh, when, when gas tax receipts were high at the high water mark and bringing in the most money counties ever had. Uh, I talked to a couple of my fiscal court members just last week. This is the time of the year counties are opening bids for asphalt uh, for the next year. 
and and the per ton price for asphalt in my county is going to be ninety nine dollars a ton, and and that's the big factor for most counties is you know what's that asphalt bid plate laid in place that tells that fiscal court how many miles I can blacktop you know resurface whatever it's doubled in ten years and yet you know gas tax receipts in real dollars not adjusted for inflation uh, are are still much lower than they were just a few years ago. The, the freeze itself equals about $5 million just in the six months uh, that it would be in place uh, just for county road aid. And I've included in your packets just informational. Again, just this, just the facts. It's not here to necessarily uh, uh, say anything, but just to show that what that reduced county road aid amount would be in each county based on uh, the, um, uh, the reduction in the, in the or the, the freeze in the gas tax. Finally, um, again, where I started, I get it. Uh, I don't fault any governor, any legislature, any elected leader who wants to do something to show they're trying to help ease the pain at the pump. Again, I get that. Uh, gas tax freezes, gas tax holidays, big discussion nationally in these things. They all sound like really good things for struggling families in a tough economy. I get it. Uh, I've been there, I promise. But I simply ask you to use caution seriously consider the impacts of any policy decision that actually affects transportation revenues. I tried, Mr. Chairman, to rush it all through, so. Very good, appreciate it. Seeing no questions, I'm gonna, and because we're a little crunched on time, just a tad, I'm gonna go ahead and move to next up, Jennifer Kirchner, Kentuckians for Better Transportation. If you'll approach the table, thank you, Jim. Absolutely. And if you will make sure there's a mic near you with a green light on. If you'll introduce yourself for the record, then I'll administer the oath. I'm Jennifer. Jennifer. No. There we go. Got it. Jennifer Kirshner, Executive Director of Kentuckians for Better Transportation. You raise your right hand. You swear firm to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do, sir. Please proceed. Just take a moment to pull this up here. And I know you're going to have slides and stuff, but we do. We still are crunchy on time a little bit. Okay. And I uh, will keep this very brief. So just to let you know, I wanted to, Chairman Petrie, Chairman McDaniel, and members of the committee, thank you for being here. Like I said, I'm Jennifer Kirchner. I'm the Executive Director of Kentuckians for Better Transportation. Where's uh, next slide? There we go. Briefly, um, historically, we've long been an organization since 1977 that has advocated for sustainable, efficient, and effective multimodal transportation funding. Our organization has over 300 members. We represent all modes, including air, local streets, roads, highways, bridges, rail, public transit, Kentucky ports, river industries, and safety. Additionally, we, we're made up of local governments, chambers of commerce, major manufacturing and logistic companies, and they all depend on a safe and efficient network. So just briefly to echo uh, Representative Nemus as well as others' mathematical points today, uh, we too believe that this tax will only this tax suspension will only save about one dollar per month uh, for Kentuckians, which will be equivalent to thirty-five million dollars by January and potentially sixty million through twenty twenty-three if the suspension was to continue. The two cent motor fuels tax increase is well expected federal funds were included in the uh, biennial transportation budget. I think it's also important to note um, that not all of these savings will be realized by Kentuckians. It's savings to those coming to and passing through Kentucky and fueling up here. We know that our economy is one based on logistics and shipping and therefore there will be a notable loss of user fees uh, from out of state drivers. Additionally, suspending the gas tax formula, no matter if done by the governor or the legislature, cripples the funding mechanisms we have in place and renders the current motor fuels tax system irrelevant. I put this slide up. We've seen some, some forms of it in previous presentations, but I think the, what's important to note here is that we're connect, that the intent of showing this slide is to illustrate that the road fund revenues have remained flat while the general funds have steadily grown, especially with the General Assembly ta tackling tax modernization. 
From our perspective, this chart shows that the additional revenue is needed, especially as construction costs increase. And this is why KBT is concerned with the suspension of the two cent increase. Just as you've worked on the modernization of tax mechanisms to support the general fund, we look forward to working with you to do similar measures in the road fund. A few, key, a few key takeaways are that in the last eight years, to echo what I've said, we've seen little to no growth in the road fund, and that has not kept pace with rising costs and increased needs. The recent suspension of the two cent gas tax increase contributes to our chronic underfunding of transportation infrastructure. We're committed to, at KBT, we're committed to being your resource and look forward to working with you and all interested parties as we, as we look to modernize our state transportation revenue mechanisms. Um, I, I think that it's important also just to note that we appreciate the work of the General Assembly in addressing EV fees this past session. We remain engaged uh, and active in that conversation, and we welcome looking to the future. Um, I think what this, what this really underlies is that whether we agree or disagree about the two cent suspension, we all can agree that the methodology of funding our transportation infrastructure is changing. So we need to understand what's, what can we do immediately and where do we need to be going long term to account for change in energy sources. I'll leave it at that. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Very good. Thank you. I'll um, inform members and it should be on, um, on the website also. There is a, an opinion submission from Kentuckians for Better Transportation, which is a further summary of what, what you've related so far. Thank you again, and thank each of the presenters on that topic. Seeing no persons seeking recognition on that, we're going to move to the next topic, broadband deployment. Um, although I have looked, I cannot find John Hicks, state budget director. Is he? Oh, there he is right up front. I didn't see it. Sorry, John. Uh, Sandy Williams, KIA, and Perry Newcomb, Jeff Hahn. We're going to just talk with uh, Director Hicks and, and uh, Director Williams first. And I think there may be others attending remotely on this one. Broadband deployment. Director Hicks, good to see you again. Ms. Williams, if y'all will introduce yourselves for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Hicks, uh, State Budget Director. Sandy Williams, uh, Executive Director of the Technical Infrastructure Authority. Very good. Make sure that that mic is good and close to you and the green light is on, okay? Just make sure it's good and close. If you'll raise your right hands, do you swear firm to tell the truth, hold truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. Thank you very much. And what we've got is broadband deployment. Some years ago, um, I think Representative Pratt, who may still be in the room, uh, worked on a broadband deployment fund. And then in 2021, there was money inserted with a process. Uh, and then in 2022, we have reworked portions of that process, uh, reinserted the money. Um, and that new process is very much different than a competitive application to now a, an application grant type process. Uh, also established an office of broadband within KIA. The administration had talked with us multiple times and, and although I believe that Director Hicks did everything he could do and he did a great job uh, plowing new ground on this field, uh, it was good for all to have a point person and a point division that dealt with just broadband to develop that expertise over time. So we have had, as I understand, our first round of funding lets that started earlier last year. Um, we were looking for a $50 million addressing, and I think maybe $83 million has been let in the last couple of three weeks off of that, through that first process. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right. And um, um, if you, with that, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure we all know where we were. So I'm looking for an update on uh, is there anything remaining under the first process? And I might have a question or two about that one and how the distribution worked out. Mm -hmm. And then where are we at on the new process and implementation and how Ms. Williams may be proceeding with that one? Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. You know, a uh, lot of good news coming out of uh, uh, this topic, broadband deployment, right? Every state wants to have universal service, access to everyone in Kentucky and in their state. And uh, the biggest change that's happened, in addition to what Representative Petrie and the Chairman has talked about with House Bill 315, is the federal government has stepped up and is putting in an awful lot of funding to states you know, to do that very thing. And so, so I'm going to give you a couple of updates. I'm going to talk about House Bill 315 and the processes, but also about the funding sources that are in front of us and have great opportunity. Uh, Right now, we uh, uh, $300 million was, was appropriated originally in the 21 session uh, for broadband deployment. 
uh, as a result of some changes and, and guidance from the federal government, uh, the 22 session that just uh, finished in the budget process, split that $300 million between two federal sources. One was the American Rescue Plan State Fiscal Recovery Fund, and the other is the American Rescue Plan's Capital Projects Fund. And you can see in, on the slide about $117 million of the first pot and $183 million of the second pot. So how much have we committed? Uh, as, as the chairman said, we had 47 awards just recently announced, about uh, just under $90 million in grant funding. Uh, one reason it was so many awards is that we put a $5 million uh, cap on an individual award. So we had uh, at least a dozen, a, a dozen awardees comprising the 47 uh, awards, but $204 million in total investment. That incorporates the, the match requirement, at least a 50% match, and might I add that two-thirds of the awards incorporated match from fiscal courts, which, which really tells you, you know, the, the working together process that is going on outside in our counties out in Kentucky. That was wonderful to see. More than 34,000 unserved households and businesses are proposed to be covered by these awards touching 36 counties. Uh, so with that 89 million, it left, that left about 27 and a half million from that first pot of 117 million. Next steps, the Office of Broadband Deployment. Nobody on this earth is more glad that we're creating the Office of Broadband Deployment than, than I. Uh, uh, and uh, I have to say, I, I attended, uh, Mr. Chairman, I attended a 38-state summit uh, that the National Governors Association and NTIA sponsored, uh, and there's a lot of states in a similar situation. They may have had a broadband office for a couple of years, but only a couple of years, and maybe one or two people, and I looked at him and told him I'm the state budget director, so why am I here? And I said, I made sure, with the General Assembly's help, that we got a budget for an office of broadband. Uh, because you know, with, with, because those some of those states are really in, in tough situations with that. So, next steps, right? We've got that 182.8 million from the Capital Projects Fund. Uh, the application development for the next round of funding is going to incorporate House Bill 315's processes and the requirements of that Capital Projects Fund, and uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then and then the big money. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the broadband program, and then also in House Bill 315, I'll mention a few things about a pole replacement program that, that is to go to unserved broadband areas. Next. So we're searching for the executive director right now, uh, a wide range of duties and responsibilities in the legislation for that uh, you know, broad policy, but to administer the broadband deployment fund and provide a single point of contact here at at, in Frankfurt, develop a statewide plan, uh, very common across the states in the country, to create a strategic plan, a master plan for broadband deployment across. It also aligns with the federal government's requirements on the, on the uh, program I'll talk about later, the requirement to have a five-year action plan uh, for, a, for the big pot of money at the federal government. So these, those two things align. Uh, to develop a statewide uh, mapping uh, uh, capability uh, Right now, we, as I used to use the phrase, we had an indicative map. It was, it was information we knew about and we could gather, but we knew it wasn't perfect. The Federal Communications Commission is in the process of gathering more detailed information across from all providers, in addition to any other, anybody else who wants to submit data, to create a broadband map to, down to the location specificity and, and served, unserved, underserved in terms of uh, speeds of, of internet uh, available to them. So we know that won't be a perfect step, but it'll be a far bigger improvement uh, across the country in the information on where do we have broadband, where do we not have broadband. Uh, we're going to maintain statewide data. We're going to watch federal grants that go directly to providers, try to keep a track of, of what is the progress being made by any kinds of investment in broadband deployment. Next, uh, let me talk about the Capital Projects Fund briefly. Uh, to, in order to access and use those funds, each state must submit a grant plan and a program plan for approval. We've had a couple of calls already. This is being administered by the U.S. Department of Treasury, and so we've already had some calls with them about, we've talked to them about House Bill 315, what we're doing in here. Their eyes brightened up when I said one thing that's in this legislation that I don't think you'll see in other states' legislation is the term, no service. The first dollar out of these funds are going to go to areas that have no service. We don't have to measure how fast the speed is. It's none. 
I, they were really pleased with that. I have to tell you, Mr. Chairman, they, you know, it was it was something that they they really brightened up and said. So anyway, we were telling them about House Bill 315, and they said that you know that sounds really aligned with the requirements that we have in submitting a grant plan. So we're working on a grant plan so that we can then have a program plan, which won't be very different. So I won't go into the details because. In some states, you can use that pot of money for several different things. In Kentucky, we're using it for broadband deployment, so we don't have this multiple uh, uh, uses uh, that we're going to do with, with our funding. And so, uh, so the next application development, as the chairman has said, it's not going to be a request for a proposal. It's going to be a grant process uh, and a lot of detail in House Bill 315 about uh, uh, not just the information that's in, in the application, but the, the timing of the actions taken. Uh, and, uh, and and some of the other things. One of the more unique elements, well, I think I've got it in the next slide, um, in, in House Bill 315, I've mentioned some of these before, but you know, that really small bullet that you can't read uh, down at the bottom, uh, you know, no service first, unserved locations next, underserved after that. A higher priority and a higher possible state match for unserved areas based upon location density. So that was something else. Some of my peers uh, from other states were really interested in that piece of legislation is that there is a rubric for determining low density, you know, areas of, of the Commonwealth. We have plenty. And with them having no service first, that there is a possibility that they can have a higher state share of their grant award because of the high capital costs associated with reaching those outer areas. And so, uh, so some of the other priorities that are in House Bill 315 that follow that, but we're first going to go follow in the next round the no service uh, and and this you know and see how this location density measurement uh, plays out in the next round of, of broadband. So the infrastructure bill is easy for me to say. It's you'll hear the word I hate acronyms, but bead. Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program is the federal government's big program. Uh, and uh, this was passed. It's going to be administered by the National Telecommunications Information Administration. And those, that's, the, that's the federal agency that knows broadband the most. And so we have a lot of subject matter expertise there. And they've been very, uh, uh, very good in outreach with all the states. Uh, so, so $100 million in, this, in the legislation minimum. Forget $100 million. We're going to split a 37, I should say, billion uh, dollar uh, pot across all 50 states and territories and, 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 uh, and tribal lands. Uh, an estimate, and it's, these are outside estimates not given by the federal government, says that Kentucky could receive up to $700 million, uh, which, which in this estimate was about 23rd most of the 50 states. Uh, so that, that one, that's wonderful news. The $300 million you've already appropriated. The 700 million possible, there's a billion dollars there to deploy broadband to unserved and then underserved areas in Kentucky. Uh, that process will take a while. I mentioned that FCC map they're working on. That's going to be the trigger to determine how much each state will get out of that 37 billion. Uh, and so that's so they're going to they're working on that. And but that won't the allocations we don't expect until early in calendar 2023. Uh, and so in the meantime. Each state has to submit a planning grant application, and there's good funding to go with that. Uh, lots of efforts similar to House Bill 315. We've got to have a statewide plan. We have to have community engagement, uh, local officials, community-based organizations, libraries, education, post-secondary ed, businesses. We're going to reach out to everyone in, in terms of forming this, not only this strategic plan, but this action plan that is necessary to, tr to unleash this potentially $700 million next year. And so so good thing is we've got time to get that done. Uh, but I wanted you to know that there's an effort that we will be making out of Frankfurt, but with everybody else, to uh, engage the, all of the Commonwealth in, in a five-year action plan slash strategic plan for the Commonwealth. Next, there's another piece that was in the infrastructure bill around broadband, but it's called digital equity. Uh, had a consultant kind of give me that simplicity of broadband, devices, skills. You have to have all three to successfully, you know, work on the Internet, entertain on the Internet, apply for a job on the Internet. And so digital equity is a, is a phrase that really goes to digital literacy, digital skills. 
And so we've got to put a plan together on how, how the Commonwealth will exercise this. We're going to get about $20 million over five years in order to roll this out. Uh, and we've got to have a planning grant first. Uh, and these two plans I mentioned, the action plan and this digital equity plan, have to be aligned. Uh, and so this next nine months uh, you know, is, a, is a time period, the deadline to get that done. But I want to make you all aware we're going to do the same thing on this engagement, right? Our libraries, right, we think about our libraries help people who don't know how to get online, who don't know how to access uh, uh, certain services there at the library because they don't have broadband at home or they don't have a laptop. Uh, we're going to go way beyond that and engage all those who are working on digital skills and, and create an inventory of what's available and create an action plan that says what else can you do to help. Because if we're going to bring broadband you know, to areas that don't have it now, you're going to have uh, individuals who may be able to work on a phone but may not be able to turn on that laptop and, and get on the Internet. Uh, so there are a lot of things that are going to go with that. All positive, though. The, the outcome to be, not only do you have it, you can use it. Now, uh, in House Bill 315, there's $20 million from the uh, American Rescue Plan Act, State and Fiscal Recovery Fund, called the Rural in Infrastructure Improvement Program. It, it is a, it's set up to be a reimbursement of expenses for the removal, replacement of utility poles that were necessary to bring and provide broadband service to unserved areas. So we're not replacing poles where there's already sufficient broadband. They have to be in a project that's going to achieve deployment in an underserved or unserved area before they can access reimbursement funds from this pot of money uh, for pole replacements because uh, it's, it's just a part of the construction process of, of bringing broadband and fiber particularly, you know, across, uh, you know, uh, you know, all, all of the land in Kentucky. Uh, there are some limits and requirements in there. There's still a matching requirement. Uh, it's kind of a first come, first serve process. An application will have to be available by September 1. And we'll match it up with the requirements of the federal funds that we're using here. I see no problems with that because of the unserved uh, requirement that's associated with that. So in essence, we're going to help subsidize part of the construction costs, pole replacements, for projects that are going to deploy broadband in unserved areas. Very so, good. I'm going to stop you right there. Very good. Appreciate it. Um, really quickly, and don't forget, we've got a few more people presenting on broadband. Then we're going to go back to water and wastewater. Um, I know that we've changed processes by which the money is being put out mm -hmm. uh, for the deployment of broadband and trying to get to those unserved, no service, underserved areas. Um, that first year was uh, painfully slow. I'm hoping that with the Office of Broadband, and I know you and I talked back there in session, that it will be, it's already ready to go, ramped up, uh, things to do, but you're ready to move forward with that office and utilize it, correct? Yes, we are. Okay, very good. Uh, and I think that application grant process should speed things up tremendously it will and also with some of the timelines that are in there about you know certain tasks that have to take place within certain number of days good um, one continuing issue that we seem to have and you and I've discussed it and I know many members of this committee have we have two regions in Kentucky when we deal with uh, deployment it seems like we have uh, TVA related areas and we have PSC related areas and um, uh, just real quickly uh, staff had put together where the first round of distributions went out mm -hmm. Uh, um, that first 89 million I think that was referenced in the slide and there is some in far west Kentucky for which I'm extraordinarily thankful but uh, well over 60 right at 60 million of that went right toward the middle of the state around Louisville um, there is almost there is almost nothing west of I-75 east. east of I-75 my bad yeah. east of I-75 there is almost nothing and then you can tell where the other PSC region runs up mm -hmm. through West Kentucky, it's bereft of, of lets. Um, I continue to work on that. I ask you to continue to work on that. Just understand that we took notice of that. Mm -hmm. We knew that it would be behind, but it can't be behind. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, I understand. One of the things, and talk about this engagement, you know, we all are dependent upon the providers. And we have providers of various places, private sector, municipal, co-ops, telephone, electric co-ops, 
they're the ones that are going to have to get this job done. What we're going to try to do is help lower the cost of capital oh. of that deployment. Uh, yeah, we're but, all good with that. But but if they don't if they don't come in the front door, right? You, you can't award any funding. Correct, but that may be something we have to work on. And thankfully, I've got two masterminds behind 315 and the other bill, Senator Givens and Representative Reed, so they know exactly what's going on. And they've had those same concerns about yep. PSC regions and people who haven't been in the mode of even thinking about broadband deployment because it wasn't available to them. So that's something I'm just showing. When you do a shotgun approach of where the distribution went, there's concern of, okay, we've got to watch for that. That's right. Now, with that said, I think we have some others. Um, Perry Newcomb, Judge Exec, Jeff Hahn, Kennergy, and maybe some by internet, remote, I'm not sure. Now, I will tell you, we've got about maybe 10 minutes or so at best, and then we're going to switch back over to water and wastewater if, if Director Hicks will come back up at that point. We'll finish out with that topic. We've got a hard stop at 2.55, uh, soft stop any time before that. <laughs> All right, if you will introduce yourselves for the record, please make sure you got green lights on, microphones close enough to you. Jeff Hohn. Okay, Jeff Hohn, President and CEO of Kennergy. Brad Schneider, Henderson County Judge Executive. Perry Newcomb, Crittenden County Judge Executive. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, if you will me, allow me just a little attitude, Adam Snyder was listed on your agenda, and that was because of a time... Oh. Yes. conflict with Judge Snyder and a, a questionable whether he would be here. So thank you, we Ms. appreciate you that out to me previously. And yes, thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. If each of you raise your right hands. Do you swear firm to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, please proceed. You know what the topic is. And, and uh, so what are your thoughts on it from the county and local perspective? Okay, well, I'll go, I'll go first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting us to, to come make a presentation before you. Uh, I'd like to thank the General Assembly for the passage of HB 315. Prior to that, um, we're a PSC regulated utility, so prior to that, we needed to get a CPCN to do what we're looking at doing. Um, since the passage of HB 315, we have received notice from our lender that uh, CPCN is no longer required, and we also got an order from the commission which states the exact same thing. So we're ready to proceed. Um, we have approximate, we have done some of the engineering, the pre-engineering on the project. Uh, we are ready to do make ready. Um, that's about a $25 million project or part of the project. And once we do finish the make ready, we'll be ready to start construction. Um, with that, um, we serve approximately 59,000 meters in our service territory. Okay. Of that 35,000 are considered either unserved or underserved by the FCC, um, maps. So that's about 60% of our membership is considered unserved and or underserved. So for us, the money in HB 315 is, is, is vital to be released because of the fact that um, if we start construction and we go to a place that's considered unserved or underserved, we would not be eligible to get the, the grant money for those projects. So our members would be responsible for paying for that and we'd be leaving grant money on the table. So we're very, very excited about what Mr. Hicks said that and as soon as we can get that money, as soon as the application process becomes available, we will be applying for it and we'll be moving forward. So we're waiting for that as far as construction is concerned. Very good. And I really hate to do this, but Director Hicks, uh, can you just step back to the microphone really quickly? I meant to ask this. You can stay right where you are at the table. I just need you to step up so we can hear you. Okay, here's a PSA part of this. So there's a, a local entity out there, government or non, that wants to avail itself of what the legislature and the administration is executing as far as most recent bill and the application process for broadband deployment. To whom do they address their questions, requests, applications? The point person as of this day and this moment is who? It would be me on the point person. I'm soon going to hand it off to someone else. But uh, the the trigger mechanisms are, 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 are working with the U.S. Department of Treasury on the grant plan and then kind of uh, Correlated with that will be the development of our grant application. So it's really the development of the grant application that's going to be the trigger. We'll put it out and you know broadcast it widely. Uh, but one of the th we're trying to we're going to make sure that that application coincides and, and, and complies with the federal guidelines. Is, Very is, good. Is the thing so if someone on. at the local level today, tomorrow, or the day after until it changes over to a broadband 
contact person on the new division to be created, yes. the new person to be hired on, uh, then budget director John Hicks mm -hmm. is the person to contact with all questions and all things related to those applications <laughs> until that process is up fully running. Is that what I understood? Yeah, I'm hoping for simple questions. <laughs> very like, good. Do you have you a get your business card? Yeah, do you have a card? Want to make sure. Thank you very much. We can find you, you know, on the website. Every, every government email is online. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Because that's so important to us is the fact that um, our, we're looking at a three year, three to five year build out. So the contractor is going to be putting in 150 to 200 miles a year. And yeah. every every day we wait is one more day the members don't get broadband. Understood. Next up. I appreciate your comments over the last uh, five minutes, Chairman Preacher. They're all on target and well known to all of us in Western Kentucky who operate in PSC territories. It's been a slow Roll out, and I'd like to point out that it's not just about serving uh, current citizens, which we do want to, but it's also about economic development and growth. Uh, we're a border community. Uh, many people who are looking to locate for various reasons, either urban flight, uh, looking to work in uh, remote uh, locations because they don't have to work in cities anymore, one of their first uh, determinations on where they're going to buy a house is internet availability and speed beyond sometimes even cost in schools and other things that were more important in the past. And again, we lose potential Kentuckians. We lose homeowners across the river to Evansville and Vandenberg County in Indiana because they've been able to roll out their internet uh, services faster. So my message here today, especially for rural counties, is urgency. We have a, an electrical co-op with a plan. We're ready to go. And it is a, an organization that is governed by local citizens who are elected to the co-op board so there is oversight uh, we're confident we can uh, deploy this uh, new uh, technology quickly but we are waiting on these grant projects so i ask all of you to please keep a thumb on this uh, please working on it keep working on it for us and we will use the money wisely and serve kentuckians all right, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of this committee, I want to thank you for this opportunity for us to present to you today and, and in an effort not to duplicate some of what Mr. Hahn or Judge Snyder has uh, indicated before you. I, I'm going to go through my comments relatively quickly because I know you're pressed for time. Um, as, a, as a judge executive in the 14-county area, coverage area of Kenergy, uh, I represent an even more rural county than does Judge Snyder. And first and foremost, on behalf of my fellow county judge executives in the Kennedy area, we want to express our gratitude to the General Assembly for establishing the Office of Broadband Deployment during this past session. Like most other states, a dedicated statewide office comprised of professionals from this industry is sure to help internet providers, county governments, state offices, and other stakeholders in the industry by creating a centralized point of information and assistance. We all want the same outcome, as I'm sure you guys do, and that's to provide broadband service to all of Kentucky, no matter where you choose to live. As Judge Snyder indicated, there's not a hardly a day goes by that any of our, us in the Kennedy coverage area receives a phone call asking about what area of our county they can find reliable, high-speed, affordable internet. And unfortunately, at this time, the majority of us have to say, we're sorry, but that's just not available and that's become a real problem. I, I know and I'm sure these same conversations were had in the early 1900s with respect to electricity, and here we are today having the same discussions about internet and the importance of growing our rural communities with this n now n necessity uh, and much needed um, provision. Uh, with that, I, I just want to give a couple real quick examples of some of the struggles folks in rural parts of our county, of Crittenden County, uh, have. We've got uh, one gentleman who's a software engineer for a major uh, nationwide company. And AT&T, well, many big box providers. I'll not just pick on AT&T. I'll pick on all the big box providers. They've put in infrastructure throughout our counties, but they refuse to make it available. And, and this gentleman that serves his company as an, a software engineer um, was able to work with AT&T after several years to get them to turn on a business fiber suitable to meet his needs in a rural part of our community. But he's paying over $600 a month for that service. 
it's a 50 meg by 50 meg service, which is not high speed in today's standards. And um, another situation, we've, we've got a, a, some folks that are artists for Bonefish Grill, and they're paying to get a 25 by 25 service, they would pay over $700 a month uh, to another big box provider. So as you can see, it's an extreme hardship, and you guys know this. We, we know you know this because of the actions you've taken and the appropriations you've made. We just ask that these uh, required uh, standards and, and processes that we need to go through to be able to access the funds that have been appropriated are established as quickly as possible. I'm sure the stand-up of the Office of uh, Broadband Deployment will uh, expedite that process. And um, Mr. Hicks, hopefully we won't have to continue to bombard you with requests. We can pass that along to the next gentleman. But I, I thank you for the, your time and, and appreciate all of you. Thank you all very much. I know Representative Raymond had one question. I think Director Hicks may be able to hit that. Um, seeing no one else seeking recognition. Hey, Director Hicks, would you thank you all very much. Was there anybody online that needed to speak up? I'm just asking right now. Now, going three, two, one. We're closed. All right, Director Hicks, Ms. Williams, and Representative Raymond, would you ask your question um, quickly and see if Mr. Hicks can answer that or if we need to do that outside of the committee? Yes, I just wanted to ask for simple definitions, please, of no service unserved and underserved and that those are FCC definitions correct no they're actually definitions in House Bill 315 okay. no serves not defined but I think we all know what that means uh, unserved is uh, 25 meg 3 meg download upload and then underserved I've already forgotten but Uh, it's it's more than that yeah more than 25 three sorry uh, the federal requirements though put the deployment has to meet a hundred meg up and 100 meg down so so you know so what we're gonna get hopefully you know is access to high-speed internet no matter whether you're no served or unserved okay and so so how do our definitions interact with this FCC map are they they're using our definitions in their map of underserved and unserved no, we're the, getting to a point now where I think we may want to go outside of the committee to dig into that. I hate to say that, but because it's a good question, uh, but we're in the nuts and bolts of that at this point. I really need to make sure we're able to cover, cover the last topic, drinking water and wastewater grant program. This is um, in large part a continuation of an attempt that went out a last session, uh, not the last year. Um, two programs that went out, one with more discretionary across the board, one that was an allocation per county, uh, roughly based on population with an offset. Uh, that second program was re-upped this last session, additional monies put in, and in large part, um, as I recall, there were a lot more applications and requests than money was available per county in the last round. So that's the continuation for this. And if you can speak to what it is, what the need may be in your estimation, how it's going to work in a PSA part of it of when uh, someone out there with a water or wastewater issue in local government or local entity uh, has a question about what's available and to whom should they direct their inquiries. All right, I'm going to help out Sandy. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Good introduction. Uh, $250 million appropriated by the 21 session out of the uh, American Rescue Plan Act, another $250 million in the 22 session, plus a set of other kind of project-specific uh, funding in addition to that second $250 um, So uh, $200 million of that first $250 has been committed. $150 million is approved. Uh, 50 million of it, uh, uh, you know, we had other set-asides in that first 250 for unserved uh, and, and federal consent decree areas. Uh, and so, uh, so, the, so the 200 million has, has been approved with about 50, uh, 50 million left. And we had in mind, and the legislature had in mind, the prospects of supplementing a project grant where the cost is greater than the out county's allocation or in case of cost escalations, which we're seeing in other construction projects. So a uh, very successful rollout of this first round. You know, the Kentucky Infrastructure Authority is a loan uh, program. This is a grant program. They have some small grant programs, but this is the first time we've had major, major funding for grant programs. Um, 
So next round. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, next round, uh, call for projects starting in July. I think it is July, so soon, uh, based on uh, uh, local consensus. And what that means is the, as the chairman said, the allocations have a by county, by population. And so, so, the, so the special districts in those locations come together with the local elected officials and, and decide, you know, what are the projects they're going to seek to be awarded from these funds, from the capped amount that they have within their county. Uh, and so uh, it fits right in with our longstanding water resources information system, the role of their development districts, our, uh, the participation of our uh, Division of Water and the Energy and Environment Cabinet, uh, a well, uh, you know, a very experienced and known and understood process. Uh, so one of the suggestions, let me go back just a minute, because one of the suggestions that Sandy and her folks at the Infrastructure Authority say that round two funding, uh, you know, suggestion here that would be provided to round one projects that didn't receive full funding in round one before adding new partially funded projects. We're just making available to the counties and the locals that's possible right? They get to choose which projects they're going to seek funding for. And the list of funding availability by county is, uh, is on the KIA website, kia.ky.gov, uh, easily found. Uh, next. And so how will they apply? They'll use the water resource information system, project profile information as the application. Everyone's well acquainted with that part of the process. They coordinate, you know, with the area development district, their water management councils, uh, and the, the coordinators there, you know, help utilities complete the project profile and, and how to go through the details of, of the application uh, uh, you know, for this next round of funding. So, uh, you know, working through with the area development districts, communicating with elected officials and utility managers, you know, the governor talks to the county judges and the, and the mayors uh, frequently, at least once a month, and we continue to advertise this this pot of funds and the and the and the availability of them and the purposes of them uh, and uh, and so then there's a project approval process that is a kind of a rolling approval process we don't have a competitive process here is if, if once they get applications and there's they're sufficient and, and complete, uh, then there's an approval process that follows that, uh, followed by the, the documentations, a grant commitment letter, and assistance agreement, uh, and then projects can get underway and, and completed. And so the, you know, the reimbursement process, for example, of these projects are similar to what they do for the two revolving loan funds that KIA administers. So again, a, a, an administrative process that is understood and known. I think that's it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, really, really quickly. Well, what we got? Really, really quickly. Uh, so, at the conclusion of both rounds of this funding, how much will pass uh, for the purpose of water and wastewater in the Commonwealth last round and this round that's coming out? I'm trying to think with those extra projects. It's something like around 540 million dollars. Okay. And, and do you have any um, uh, reasonable estimate of how? short that will be on target or above and beyond what the needs are in the Commonwealth? I'll yield to the expert to my left. <laughs> uh, so the we were about three times oversubscribed on our first round um, and it, it always seems that there's never enough funding um, we we've heard that and with the price escalations um, that that uh, so I, I believe there will always be a need yes and, and, I, and I would add mr. chairman that that in the budget you all enacted was a substantial increase in federal funding from the infrastructure yes. bill for the two revolving loan funds so we will have a larger amount of funding available for those low interest loans very good senator Carroll Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just real quickly uh, here, the projects in uh, the counties that involve uh, uh, combining of water and sewer districts, do those projects receive any special consideration? Is, is that, is that a, a goal within uh, this, these funding to try to merge some of these uh, services? That's a good question. Regionalization of services is always um, considered and and we would hope that the utilities would give consideration to that and when they participate in their water management councils that's one of the things they discuss and fun, just real quickly uh is there any funding headed down towards marion 
to help with the crisis they're having? Let, let me answer that question. You know, the, the division of water in the Energy and Environment Cabinet and, and our emergency management uh, operation have been working with local officials in the city of Marion to determine what is the best next step to, to maintain water supply, then what is a permanent step, you know, to, 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 to deal with that. And so, so they're kind of engineering right now that first intermediate step, you know, in, in order to enable a water supply for, for Marion. Uh, you know, the, 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 you know, part of that effort may lead to uh, an, a need for some state funding to deal with that emergency. So while, so we haven't gotten to that point yet, Senator Carroll, but we're moving in that direction which is, and I'll, I'll recount for those of you who remember, remember when Wolf Creek Dam was under uh, 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 concern and had to lower the lake. Uh, back then, Governor Fletcher, you know, issued some emergency orders that helped because some of the water districts didn't have, couldn't access their water supply because of the lowering of the lake. And so this is a different but similar situation that we're looking at in terms of assisting them to make sure that they have adequate water. Representative McCool. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here today. I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. You know, in my area, we have some uh, uh, folks who do not have good, uh, clean drinking water, and they're paying a pretty high price for that. But in addition to that, I wanted to, uh, you know, there's an area that, that's really, and I, I see you're about to uh, coordinate with the uh, area, you know, area development districts and elected officials, which is their uh, county judges and utility managements. But I have an area that's in Martin County that it's really, they need a, they, they take a token to drive down to get water. Now they pay for those tokens, as I understand that. And they drive down to get water to bring back to their home. Now, they could have service of water if they could get the water from uh, Johnson County. But at the same time, they, they, they need a pump there to send it over across the, so you have, there, and they're all good. The, the elected officials there, the county judges, the, uh, uh, the water district uh, committees are very good. Uh, somebody needs to grab the bull by the horn and say, okay, this is how we're going to fix this problem. We know what you need. If it's being a pump that will write a grant for it, it doesn't matter who gets it, as long as the people get uh, drinking water. And, and right now we have some uh, dire need, in, and certainly in Martin County, and parts of Pike County that does not have water. So uh, we're talking about broadband and all those services. They need those too. But we're talking about just regular drinking water that we take so much for granted. And th those folks don't have that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? No, sir. I thank you all very much. I look forward to great things. Uh, I think everybody understands that uh, now, 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 as fast as we can, and that's like <laughs> everything else. But this one in particular for today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, would encourage everyone to review the correspondence from Jenny Bannister, uh, Deputy Director. Uh, those are in your packet, interim allotment adjustments, interim emergency appropriation increases, interim appropriation revisions for the first quarter of 2023. It is invigorating and inspiring reading. I would encourage everyone to partake of it fully. Uh, there are a list of reports received since June 2022. Looks like our next meeting is currently scheduled for August 17, 2022. And Senator Chris McDaniel will have the chair that day and we'll have a great meeting ahead of us. Last but not least is this. Uh, a packet was handed out to you uh, from the Kentucky Personnel Cabinet that was presented uh, this morning in a budget review subcommittee involving personnel. Uh, this is um, a culmination of efforts since July 7th of 2022 to address personnel salary schedules and compaction and compression issues. And this is the first attempt at uh, addressing the issue. As you recall, there was a raise granted to um, uh, state employees this last budget cycle with anticipation of where are we uh, report and analysis data, how do we adjust and what actions do we need to take in the future? This is at least a first step to get us toward that analysis. And I've already sent an invitation to the personnel cabinet and others uh, to meet with me in the next 14 days and as well as Senator McDaniel and anyone else that's uh, on board, uh, Senator Nemus, um, and make sure that we all know how we're moving forward to deal with personnel. So that is for your um, information purposes and records. Anyone else? All is well. We are adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>